Luke 22. So tonight the plan is to tackle Luke 22, and uh, there's enough in there for us to spend the whole evening on. So that's what we're going to do. It's a good reminder, now that we're getting towards the end of the book, really just have a couple more weeks left, Lord willing. We've been traveling through this book. There's over a, a thousand verses. That this, the book of Luke has the most verses out of any of the Gospels. And I've uh, been in the book of Luke for about four months. We started the beginning of February, and uh, we're about to wrap it up. And as we look at the book of Luke, Luke 19, verse 10, I think is a very good summary of the book of Luke. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And the the book really can be looked at from that particular scripture, and we can use that as an outline really for that scripture. What I mean is that that scripture in the book of Luke chapter 10, I'm sorry, um, chapter 19 verse 10, when it refers to the Son of Man, that's a, a reference from the book of Daniel that he's bringing forth and referring to Jesus as the Son of Man. And it says that he came in verses, or I'm sorry, chapters 1 through 4 really speak about Jesus and his coming, his birth. It speaks about John the Baptist. It speaks about um, their parents, Jesus' parents and John the Baptist's parents. And it really emphasizes his, his coming, uh, the, those first chapters. And then in chapters 5 through 21, talks about him seeking. And so we've been working our way through and seeing Jesus seeking people. And this is where he chose his disciples. This is where he sends them out. This is where the 70 were also sent out, 70 disciples. And, and so he, he's developing this group of people from, from himself and then his disciples and then beyond that to to seek people, and that's what Jesus was into. And then finally, we're going to look at these uh, last few chapters, and it's about Him saving, and it's about the cross and the resurrection and the gospel and what we know to be the gospel. And so that's really kind of what we're transitioning in uh, tonight, where we go and have been looking at Jesus coming and then seeking, and now we look at Him saving. So let's start in chapter... 22, verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes, they sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. And then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and he conferred, conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and they agreed to give him money. So he promised and he sought opportunity to betray him to, uh, I'm sorry, betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So now... We're, we're just hours away from Jesus being taken and beaten. We're going to see, see, see that in our text tonight. And Luke is describing to us how that happens. And it happens through an individual named Judas. And it happens not only through an individual, but it also happens at a particular time. And that's why the, I would say the postmark there or the stamp is that it was uh, during the time of the un, uh, Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the time of the Passover. So sometimes we can get those confused a little bit of what they are and uh, why they're sort of lumped together. So the Passover, the way to look at that is the Passover was a meal. And it was on the 14th of Nisan, which is one of their months that they would go by in their calendars. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a week-long feast. And so the Passover 
would commemorate the time where the death angel passed over the children of Israel and the Egyptians and those who applied the blood of a sacrificed animal on their door, they would not be harmed by the death angel. And so that was the Passover, and they commemorated that with a meal. In that meal, they had many different aspects to that meal, which were what we know now as those aspects to that meal pictured Jesus being the Passover lamb. And in, in our text, we are, are actually going to see the fulfillment of Jesus being that Passover lamb, which that feast that they commemorated would be finally commenced by Jesus actually being that, that actual Passover lamb. But the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and why there was an overlap, that wasn't actually a week-long thing. And uh, during the week, and that would start on the 15th of Nisan. And so that would be a time where they would get all of the leaven or yeast out of the house. So they'd spend a week doing that. It would remind them of their hasty uh, exit from uh, Egypt and how God delivered them out so fast. They just had to leave and there wasn't time to bake bread and things like that. And so it would be a reminder of them of the time where God delivered them again from the Egyptians. So they, they have these constant reminders that, that, that God delivered them and how he worked on their behalf. But during the week, it would be a time where they would uh, just look through all the house and try to get rid of all the leaven. And they would kind of make a, a game out of it sometimes, the, the, the parents, and they would hide leaven. And the kids would go and search for the leaven and try to get rid of it. But also, they would understand how difficult it is to get rid of leaven. So uh, just think about all the, the crumbs in your couch or under your couch or behind your refrigerator or underneath your refrigerator. That's what it would be like. It would be that, like, so for some of you, you do spring cleaning. And so the, you know, the back of your refrigerator has never seen the light of day until spring comes and you pull it out and you're astonished what's back there. And then as you see what's back there, you're, you're wondering, is there uh, animals that live back here because of what I'm seeing? And then in your couch, all of a sudden, you become independently wealthy because you find all this these uh, change in your in your couch. I guess not so much anymore, but they find toys and but you'd get all have to get all the crumbs out. And you the whole week you'd be doing that. You'd be searching to get all that out. Now that, that would be the point of that. But there would be because the feast of unleavened bread was a week, and part of that week would be preparing to get all the leaven out. Then there would be a, a overlap between. The Passover, so it was often looked at as just one big event, and so it's important because that Jesus was orchestrating all these events that were going on, as we've been pointing out. But he was going to going to die at a specific time, the time where the Passover lambs were being killed, and that's why this is important to note these things. But see, uh, not only is there a time stamp here in in events that are so particular to what's going on that it, it's important for us to take note. And if we really want to dig into this, you go back and you look at the, what the Passover meal involved. And some of you maybe have been to, they call it a Seder din dinner, S-E-D-A-R. And, you know, through all that meal that they would celebrate, there'd be all these uh, pictures and types and I, I would say previews of uh, what Jesus fulfilled, and then also with the Feast of Un Unleavened Bread. So it's, it's really, really amazing to really dig into those and look at what those represent. We don't have time to do that tonight. But then the second thing is, then there's a, an individual involved, and his name is Judas, and he's pointed out here. He's Judas Iscariot, and a uh, tragic figure. I, I find myself feeling... Uh, I guess sad in a way because you talk about a person that had been given much opportunity, that had been able to travel with Jesus, had been picked as a disciple of Jesus. And uh, somehow, some way, his heart 
got hard, and it got so hard that he full-on rejected Jesus in his heart to the extent where now he's collaborating with those who want to kill Jesus, and he's doing it for money, he's selling out, uh, giving us an, an indication of uh, sort of the things that were important to him. He is also the treasurer, we were told. He carried and took care of the money that the disciples would get in order to provide for their things that they needed to be provided for. And, um, and then it says Satan entered him. And, you know, this is, this is a case of demon possession, uh, which I know a lot of times we feel like that's not something that we see, see here as much. I, I think a lot of us will say, well, that happens more in um, places where they, like, do voodoo and things like that. But the more I've been thinking about that, I think we're seeing more manifestations of demon possession, and maybe we just don't realize it. Uh, I have to think in many of those cases where there's the transgender type of thing and hearing... Uh, some of the things going on there, I have to think there's some demon possession going on in, in some of those cases, and we're starting to see those more and more. Um, and then the people that are behind that, that are pushing these things um, on little children, I have to think that uh, there's demon possession going on in a, in a person that would have a child be put in a position where they would be uh, changed, mutilated forever when they don't really have a good uh, understanding of really reality and things like that. But then an adult that does would push those things on uh, a, a child. And then uh, to have a child um, go and watch um, transvestite strippers and go in front of them and be exposed to that. I have to think there's demon possession going on there because it's just so extreme and so wicked, it's so dark, so evil. Uh, however you want to slice it, it's influenced by Satan and people are allowing this to happen. And, and this is happening more and more. And it reminds me of the fact that the Bible says that when things like that are going on, specifically in the book of Romans chapter 1, that means that God is, is judging. He's given people over to themselves, to sin. And when, that's what it looks like. When God gives someone over and he just says, okay, let your sinful, rejecting, Christ-rejecting heart go and do what it wants to do, that's what it, that's what it looks like. And so um, Judas, tragic figure as... Satan entered him, and now he's looking for opportunity. Imagine that, just looking, just looking for an opportunity to do evil. And that's uh, what, what many who are influenced by Satan actually do. So, so there's a, a person involved, and this person, Judas, is involved. He's collaborating with people, with groups of people. Those specific groups of people are the religious people of the Jews. We've looked at them quite a bit. So let's continue on in verse 7. It says, the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed, and he sent Peter and John, saying, go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And so these were the instructions given to find and secure a place for them to have this Passover meal. Uh, one interesting detail is they were to look for a man carrying a pitcher. And normally a pitcher of water, normally men didn't do that. So normally that was the women that did that. And so that would be something that would stand out pretty well. But you can see Jesus giving these instructions. Now, mind you, this is the Passover time. So that means, according to Josephus, there were uh, over 200,000 lambs killed. Um, over 200,000 lambs killed. And there were approximately... 
10 people per lamb that would celebrate the Passover feast. So there's over 2 million people in Jerusalem. And if you go to Jerusalem, you kind of get this feel. It's tight. It's, uh, you know, really, it's amazing that this many people can be traveling around in this small area, this small city. But during the Passover, it would be bustling with activity. It would be uh, just so many things going on. And the central focus would be the, the priest that would be slaughtering these 2 million lambs, and they would only do it between 3 and 5 p.m. So it's a very short window, and so there'd just be all these things going on. And Jesus is telling his disciples, um, you need to secure a place. That's not that easy to do. If you can kind of imagine going to, say, let's see, a good example. Say you're going to Lincoln, Nebraska, when they're going to play, uh, say, Oklahoma and football, which they're actually going to do this year, and you tried to get a hotel there, and it would be everything would be booked. So there's so many people to sit now the day after the football game, then you could get a hotel, no problem. But there's such a big thing that you wouldn't be able to secure a hotel. But so he's saying, go find this place. But Jesus has the whole thing orchestrated, and um, this is one place that we go to when we're in Israel that. It's a likely place where the upper room is. It's, um, yeah, so that's another thing, but I don't want to go down that trail. But So they're told to find this man, and if they find this man, he's going to lead you in the right direction. He's going to be carrying water. And then it says, follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large uh, furnished upper room and there make ready. So they went and they found it just as he said, and they prepared the Passover. So that would be a, a quite a bit of, you know, we read that and just think, oh, yeah, they just find this room, find a guy, follow him, find, uh, find this room. But they would probably at this point already have the lamb because the lamb would be secured on the 10th of Nisan and the Passover would be on the, do you guys remember? 14th of Nisan. So they'd probably already have the lamb, but they'd have to take it to the priest to have it slaughtered and then they'd have to prepare it and then they'd have to prepare all the other arrangements. So, so this was going on and now... In verse 14, it says, When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him, and he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover. Isn't that amazing? As we've been traveling through the book of Luke, and on Sunday we've gone through Matthew, and we've gone, we're in Mark, and here we, Jesus is saying in our vernacular, I've been so excited my whole life to sit down and have this Passover meal with you. He's, he has a fervent desire. And it reminds me, and I hope we understand that now as New Covenant, New Testament believers, Jesus fervently desires to spend time with us. To fellowship with us. And when I read that, it just it really struck a, a nerve with me. Why did he why was he so passionate about sitting down and having this Passover meal? I, we can speculate, we don't know for sure, but this was this was such an important time of communion and fellowship because this is this is right before Jesus was taken. This is the last time the world would be shut out. This was the last time that there would be peace and calm. This would be the last time that he would be able in this setting to enjoy just this peaceful time. And Jesus knew in the back of his mind, he knew what was awaiting him right out the door. And yet it was so important for him to spend time with the disciples. And I believe that's something that Jesus is telling us today. 
that he is fervently passionate about spending time with us. And if that's the way Jesus feels, I think that should be a priority to us in our life. And so Jesus, as he sit down, and he says, this is, this is the moment I've been waiting to spend this special time with you. And he says, this will happen, this is going to happen before I suffer. And then he says, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it, was, it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given to you or for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me at the table, on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom... He is betrayed. And then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. So as they're having the supper, Jesus puts puts it out there for them that his suffering is coming soon. But it says that it's been determined. So we get this really uh, important understanding that Jesus continues to inform us that he is in control of these events. In other words, he's not a victim of circumstances. But this has been planned even in eternity past. And we see Jesus providentially and miraculously working out the details of what's happening. But here's the thing. That does not excuse and does not omit free will. So Jesus says this has been determined, but he also says that the person by whose hand this is going to happen, that he is responsible for what he's doing. So we see this interesting blend of predestination, foreknowledge, but also free will, and responsibility. Now, if you have those all figured out, God bless you. But all I know is that when I look at the Bible, I see that God is in control sovereignly of events, but I also see that man has free will and is responsible for his choices. Now, how those things all work out, I have some of my ideas, but it's really not important. What's important is that we see both. We see personal responsibility, and we also see God's sovereignty. So I'm okay with that personally. I'm okay seeing both of those and working those out and knowing that I am responsible for my choices, and especially in regards to choosing to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that he offers me. I see that I have the free will to do that. So as we see this event, we see this sort of calm before the storm. We see this precious time that Jesus now is is imparting truths to his disciples that they're going to need because they're going to carry the torch. And One of those big truths is that this new covenant is going to be a covenant of blood. So we have the old covenant, and now we have the new covenant. And Jesus is explaining that. And because of the new covenant, that means that the old covenant is no longer in effect. That's what's important here. So this is really the last official Passover meal. Because all of those 
over a thousand years of Passover meals that they had led up to this moment that Jesus would fulfill those Passover meals. And Jesus is saying that when he goes to the cross and dies and rises again, he said that that is the once and for all final atonement for sin. That there's not an ongoing atonement for sin. When Jesus was at the cross, one of the things he said was, it is, it is finished. And when he, he said that, he meant it. It means by his blood he has fulfilled the law and he has fulfilled the required necessary sacrifice so that now as he passed around the bread and he passed around the cup and he, he said, this is my body and this is my blood. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He's not saying that that bread and that cup are something we have to continue continually to do to continually make atonement for our sins. What he was saying is that we're to do that in remembrance of what Jesus has done. It is finished. It is final. It is complete. And that's what Jesus was saying here, that this, this new covenant was a covenant in blood and it was made by Jesus Christ. So in verse 24, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger." And he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued to be with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now this is amazing because what Jesus is saying is that he has a kingdom. And what Jesus is saying is that the twelve disciples they are going to have a position in his kingdom that will be specific and particular to them. And he says the reason was is because they were with him in his trials and his suffering. And so what is he referring to? The disciples at this moment, was they were hoping he was referring to the kingdom now that was coming right then. However, as we sit here 2,000 years later, we know that he didn't mean that. And the Bible actually tells us there's going to be a distance, a time gap between when he died and rose again and between when he sets up his kingdom. So what he's referring to is when he comes in the second coming and sets up his kingdom on earth. He will set up his kingdom and you will have the disciples will be sort of in positions of authority, specific, particular positions where well, they will be judging. They will be judges. They will be in those positions in the millennial kingdom. And so I find it interesting that it, it was noted that because they were with him in his trials. So the disciples at this point, they had given up a lot to be with Jesus. They had left all to follow him. And uh, Jesus continued to tell them that he was going to be killed. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to suffer, but they had a hard time getting that into their heads. And so, as Jesus was telling them that, uh, it's, it's interesting because they're about to leave him when he's in his most crucial time of suffering and his crucial um, time of trial. So, Jesus knows, though, that they will return. He knows that their knowledge is incomplete at this point, and 
that they, they, they are following him, even though in many instances they don't realize what's going on and they're demonstrating their lack of understanding because they're fighting over who's the greatest. And Jesus said, that's not what people do in my kingdom. If you're of the kingdom of the world, that's what they do. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. And, and we struggle and claw to get ahead and above other people. And Jesus is, is saying, and he was doing this, by the way, um, this, uh, Luke doesn't note this, but when he was washing the disciples' feet. And so he's giving them an example of what it means to be great in God's kingdom. It means to be a servant. It means to take the lower place. And that's what Jesus is actually doing in the text. But a, a very good application is for us is that we would learn that there, there's a special place in God's kingdom for those who follow him, especially when they do it and it costs them much. We might look at that maybe as the crowns that Jesus says that are awaiting those who follow him, those, uh, a crown that, uh, for people that are persecuted and, and all the different five different crowns. But the, the point is that God, he knows what we go through following him, and there are actually rewards to those that will come in his kingdom for those who follow him, going through trials, going through afflictions, suffering much, that there's not one thing that escapes God's notice about when we follow him and are willing to forsake all. So then in verse 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day, before you deny me three times that you know me. What a bad message to get. Satan is looking to sift you. It depends how you emphasize Jesus' statement there as to how you and I will live out, out our life on this earth. One is, we hear that statement, Satan is looking to sift you like wheat. And we live in fear. We live afraid to make decisions, to make moves, to step out in faith. Or we hear, Satan is looking to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. When one lives their life emphasizing that Jesus is praying for them, it doesn't matter if Satan is looking to sift them because Jesus is praying for them. And when we live our life remembering and understanding Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now praying for you and you and you and you, and me too. Right now. Jesus is praying for you. And so Satan is not an issue because Jesus is praying. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if God be for me, who can be against me? I want to encourage you to Remember that. Meditate upon that. Write it down. Jesus is praying for me. Put that somewhere. Put it up in your house. Jesus is praying for me. That way you'll emphasize what Jesus is doing for you so that you won't be afraid of what may be be against you. You see, oftentimes as Peter is, is 
noting here, I'm sure he noted this, that when we begin to follow the Lord more closely, more seriously, more sacrificially, that Satan also takes note of that. And as Satan takes note of that, we sense this warfare. And it's important that we connect the dots. Because sometimes we just think we're having a tough time and we don't connect the dots to the fact that this is a spiritual warfare. That Satan is looking to sift me, but instead we just maybe point to just more worldly circumstances and events and things like that that happen. But as we start to press in, it's just amazing what happens. We press in and the attacks come. But just like wheat that is sifted, it's like the separation of the wheat and the chaff. God actually uses Satan's desire to sift us to actually refine us, to grow us. And the proverb says, I can't remember exactly which one, but the proverb says, if you can't run with the footmen, how can you run with the horses? Have you heard that one? Basically, the point is, with what you have going on in your life now, if, if you can't grow from that and walk in faith from that, how are you going to be able in times of greater difficulty or times of greater use in ministry or times of greater fruitfulness? See, a lot of times we look at other people and say, well, I, I want to have uh, that effectiveness of their life and I want to be as as uh, faithful as them or powerful or, as them or gifted as them. But we, what we have to understand that what comes along with that is great testing, great trial, great pain, great suffering. Because if we can't run with the footmen, so sort of like in, in battle, if we can't handle hand-to-hand -hand combat, how are we going to handle combat with horses in greater combat? So that's the thing. Whatever you and I are going through now is preparation for greater things. God is building us, strengthening us, molding us, shaping us. But we have to remember Jesus is what? Praying for us. Jesus is praying for us. You have to remember that. Because I'm telling you, there's going to be times where you feel like giving up. You feel like packing it in. You feel like retreating. You feel like nothing's happening. Nothing's working. And I want to tell you, you have to remember Jesus is praying for you. You have to remember that. If you have to get a tattoo on your arm. No, I'm just kidding. You have to remember that. Jesus is praying for you. So get up and keep going. Because Jesus is praying for you. So verse 35, it says, And he said to them, When I sent you out without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, Nothing. And then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and li likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword... Let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have no end. And so they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. So what's happening here? Well, you may remember in Luke 9, the 12 were sent out. In Luke 10, the 70 were sent out. These are like mini missions trips to prepare them, to test them. And when they went on those trips, you may remember, they were told not to take these things. And Jesus was teaching them to depend on him. Now Jesus is preparing them for when he goes. And now he's saying, take these things. This is interesting. So now he's 
wanting them to understand that there's a balance between praying, depending, and trusting, and also the practical aspects of being wise about things. That's a difficult sort of blend mix to be able to know. But we see this for sure is Jesus saying, okay, now, and he's referring to the fact that he's, gonna, he's about to go. They're been going to be given the Holy Spirit, but when he's not physically with them, that there's going to be some practical aspects of what they're going to need in order to fulfill and accomplish what Jesus wants them to do. Now, here's the question. So Jesus even told them to take a sword. So then they say, ooh, we have two. And, it, and then Jesus says, that's enough. We don't know if Jesus was saying two's enough or if he was saying, stop, that's enough. We don't know. It seems like he was saying, don't get carried away. Don't go overboard with, notice how they just clued in on the sword too. Like they didn't say, oh, we have a whole bunch of knapsacks and stuff. It's like the sword. They cued in on that. It seemed like they're getting all fired up for this like physical altercation battle. And I think Jesus is just basically calming them down and teaching them not to go overboard. And the reason I think that is because just a little bit in a few more verses, Peter's going to take out his sword and misuse it. So I, I think he was trying to get them to understand not to live by the sword because they're to die by the sword, but to be practical and just be able in certain situations to be able to protect yourself. But let's not have a crusade and take our swords and start conquering nations with the sword. I think that that's what I think he was saying. So in verse 39, so coming out, he so now they're out, out of the upper room. So that's it. So as we read this verse and it says they're coming out, it's like so, so now he's 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 going out to be killed that time of peace and fellowship and communion and instruction, it's over. Now it's on. So coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, which is just right across the way, just east of the temple. And as he was accustomed and his disciples followed him, why, why was he accustomed? Because during the last week, that's what he was doing. He was going to the temple and then he'd go back at night to the Mount of Olives to stay the night, and then he'd go back to the temple. So from his triumphant entry, we've been reading about and studying about all these things that he's been doing going back and forth during those few days that he was there. So it says, when he came to the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed. And he said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. That's an interesting little tidbit, sleeping from sorrow. There, It was their sorrow that made them sleep. And that's, sometimes that's what happens. We can get so sad, so depressed so overwhelmed that we sleep. We just can't handle it anymore. And that was the disciples' condition. And then he said to them, Why do you sleep? 
rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So this is really a scene of preparation where Jesus is preparing his disciples by demonstrating how they are to navigate the most difficult times of pressure and anxiety and fear. And he's showing them how to do that. What is he doing? He's praying. Guys, this is something amazing for us. This is an answer to what a lot of you are going through. The pressure, when it crushes in, the answer is prayer. And and you may say, well, I do pray. Well, let me ask you this, and I ask myself this too. Do I pray like that? That's maybe the problem. When I looked at this, I pray more like the disciples. I'll pray a little bit, and then that's it. But this is a different kind of prayer. This is an intense prayer. This is a prayer of complete dependence upon the Lord. This is a prayer of asking for strength, not for something to be removed necessarily, but for the strength to go through what is ahead. And this is, this is you might want to say, a secret of how Jesus was able to keep going forward. It was through this intense prayer. So that's what, that's what I'm saying. This is intense prayer. So may our frustration, pressure, stress, anxiety, may it lead us to intense prayer. A prayer like this. A prayer of intensity. A prayer of passion. A prayer of faith. A prayer of trust, prayer of surrendering our will to God's will. Prayer where we make our petitions to God, like Jesus said, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup. What are you saying? Take this suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is a prayer of surrender. This is a prayer of trusting in God and His plan that that it's better than our plan. And as Jesus did this, he's, He's intense. He's praying and then and blood sort of seeping out of his pores, this condition where your capillaries burst in your sweat glands, and you're you're praying, but you're you're you're, you're sweating blood. This this type of intensity. And, I, and as I read this, I realize he was trying to tell the disciples, "This is what you need to be doing." And why? Lest you enter into temptation. What happened to Peter? We're going to see that. It was his lack of intense prayer that allowed him to be tempted the way he was tempted. Do you remember just a few verses ago, Jesus told Peter what he's going to do, and he said, I will never do that. What was happening? Peter was relying on his own strength, his own abilities, his own power, his own willpower, if you will. He's he's saying, I would never do that. But Peter's never been put in a position like this. And Jesus was telling him, you may not understand it, you may not realize it, but you need to pray. You don't need to be sleeping right now. You need to be praying intensely like this, lest you enter into temptation. And maybe Jesus is saying that to us. Maybe we're looking for all sort of solutions and quick antidotes. And Jesus said, get on your knees and pray. Pray intensely. And surrender your will in those prayers. Stay close to the Father. And as Jesus was saying that and the disciples were sleeping and not realizing, they, no doubt they were learning. They were watching. No, no doubt their failure uh, turned into a great lesson for them. So he says in verse 47, he says, And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and they drew near to Jesus to kiss him. So that 
This is a large group of people that started with the temple police, also included the Roman soldiers and obviously Judas here. So this is like a mob in the middle of the night coming from the temple across the Kidron Valley to this garden. And they come, and they come in a mob, and they didn't know who Jesus was, and this is Judas's moment. So in verse 48, Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with the kiss? And when those around him saw that it was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? There's our sword. And one of them struck, we know this is Peter from another account, the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know this is a man named Malchus. And Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests, the captains of the temple and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? It was so unusual for them to come at Jesus like this because they knew that he was coming with a small group of people, his disciples. They they knew they weren't violent. It was just very unusual. And Jesus called that out. In verse 53, it says, When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. What we're seeing is the power of darkness. Now, one little note, it's interesting it says that the right ear, and Luke, because he was a doctor, he points out these details, the right ear of Malchus. And Peter, most likely, was right-handed. He'd pull his sword from the right hand. So there are some who believe that Malchus was walking in the other direction in order to cut off his ear. And most likely, he was trying to cut off his head Good thing Peter is a better swordsman with the word of God than he was with the actual sword. Verse 54, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. That's strike number two for Peter. Not praying. And following at a distance. And that's how we fall away from the Lord. We stop praying. And and may I add, stop spending time with Jesus. And then we just get more distant with Him. What happens when we get more distant with Jesus? We get closer to other things. So we just don't randomly get more distant with Jesus. We get closer to other things. That's what Peter's doing. So... We see Peter not praying. We see him following at a distance. Verse 55, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter among them, Peter sat among them, and a certain servant girl seen him as he sat by the fire. She looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman! I don't know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And then after about an hour passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. How did he know that? By his accent. And Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. And immediately, while he is still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. 
And so we, we see in Peter, one, this love for God, but we also see that he was trying to administer his love for God in his own strength, in his own power, and that's why he fell. When we have a love of God, we have to first not rely on ourselves, but rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And Peter learned from this. In John 21, when Jesus restored him, he learned from this. He was a changed man. Are we learning to depend on Jesus? Are we still continually in our own strength and flesh trying to make things happen? Are we trying to not sin instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our life? Are we trusting in God and celebrating Him and praising Him and surrendering to Him and letting Him work powerfully in us and through us? Or are we trying to accomplish God's will by our own strength? And see, Peter learned that. And we need to learn that too. Verse 63, Now when the men who held Jesus mocked Him, And beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemy, blasphemously, yeah, that's a tough one. They spoke against him. And soon it was day. Now, this is interesting. So now it's day. What happened in the night was Jesus was illegally tried. He was actually tried six total times. This is, uh, verse 66 is the third time. So the first time, he went to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was the high priest that was really put in place by the Romans. See, if you were a high priest, you would serve as a high priest for a lifetime. Annas was the previous high priest. He was still alive, but he was deposed by the Romans because Caiaphas worked better with the Romans. But Annas was really the power behind the position. So Annas was really the one, even though he wasn't officially in power, but the Jews recognized him as the one who they were to look for and look for answers for. So they went to Caiaphas. Jesus went to Caiaphas. And then he went to Annas. And then here he went to the Sanhedrin, which was the overall group of 71 men plus one. There would be an an extra in case there's a a tie. And that was those who would rule the Jews theologically and politically as a group. And they would make all the decisions about it. So this this is daytime. Why is Jesus now at this place? Because you couldn't have a... It was illegal to have for the Jew... In the Jews' own law, it was illegal to have a trial at night. And it was illegal for the high priest to interrogate... A prisoner. So now, after doing two illegal trials, now they're doing a, a, what would seem like more of a legal one. So daylight's up. So now they're saying, oh, we've caught this man. We're doing this, this trial. So they're trying to make it look official. So it says, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and both the chief priests and the scribes came together and they led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, I will have to kill you. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) If I tell you, you will by no means believe. Isn't that interesting? So they say, tell us. Have you ever talked to somebody like this? So tell us the answer. So what does that mean? 
they really don't want to know. They would, they, if you told them, like, how, can you, how do you know God exists? And you tell them. Well, how, how, how do you know about the resurrection? How do you know that's right? And you tell them. They say, ah, it's a bunch of garbage. But they can't say anything back. This is like, they didn't want to know. And Jesus says that. He says, if I give you the answer, you're not going to believe. In verse 68, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Imagine hearing that. Looking at the, in the eyes of these religious people and, and Jesus saying, you're going to do what you're going to do. But right after that, I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father power of God. He says in verse 70, and then they all said, are you the son of God? And so he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. In other words, they're saying, that's all the evidence we need to kill you because you just committed blasphemy. So if he wasn't the son of God, he would have committed blasphemy. The only problem was he is the son of God. And so he's not on trial. They are on trial. And so you just made it through 71 verses. Congratulations. I hope the Lord ministered something to your heart. Actually, I know he will. So let's pray.